Thank you, Ma. Now, the, the Deputy Registrar, sir. Over to you. The Deputy Director, sir. Ah, the, the Deputy Director. <laughs> Over to you, sir. Good morning. Hello? We can hear you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, sir. I welcome everybody to this uh, facilitation. That's a 2020-2021 race semester facilitation. Just in line with uh, what uh, our boss secretary has just said, we employ the use of uh, technological driving uh, mode to administer these uh, rain semester exams because of the COVID-19 COVID pandemic. And the Almighty God uh, guide us. Amen. On behalf of the director, Professor Oti Arunobu, I welcome everybody. And uh, just as we normally say, every semester, when you came for your face-to-face -face presentation and the exam, but that we are administering this exam in technology, that does not mean that you really take it serious. Because at the end of the day, the outcome of that will be used to assess you and to build you accordingly. So take it very serious. When you are, the presentation you're about to start now, just ensure, or just to assume that we are having our normal face-to-face -face in the university. That's what I want you to assume. Because some people, they may think that uh, this thing, it may not work. It will work. But at this level, we have seen now, without uh, any out of doubt, that it's working already. So take all the courses you are doing, take it very seriously. So that, uh, and I pray that everybody will come out in bright colors. So we have all the technical teams. All members of our technical team, they are Hello, sir. Okay. Thank you, the uh, deputy director of the center. Before we move on, I would like to say one or two things. Please and please, if you don't have anything to say, you don't need to raise your hand. Wait till the lecturer, the faculty finish the lectures, and he now asks for any question. Raising hands means you have a question. We have not even started anything. You have raised your hands. For what? Don't just take it for a joke. Be serious with it. Then in addition with this, if you know you are having problem with your network, I will advise you to off your video in order to save your bandwidth. And don't forget, the attendance is very, very important. We know the number, the total number in the class. Presently, we can see only 569 in these lectures. Please and please encourage yourself and do better. Now I will hand over to the, the facilitator of this course, NSC 404, in person of Oyewumi, Okoyemi. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, you are all welcome to this morning online facilitation. My name is Oyewumi Zakios Okoyemi. I want to believe I'm not new to you. All right, uh, 
I want to believe that despite all the phobia that many of you have been having towards this uh, technological driven exams, by now you should be overcoming some of the, the, the fear. And I want to believe if only you can just focus your attention on what you have been taught, there is nothing that is new under heaven that you won't be able to tackle during this exam. So be that as it may, I will appreciate during this class that you give a rap attention to the lectures that I'll be delivering. Everything that I will be saying, they are very germane to what you'll be meeting in the uh, forthcoming examination by next week. So I will appreciate that you give it what it takes. So and after this presentation, even though most of the things that I will be saying, they are just summary of what we have, what we have learned online. You should try as much as possible to read more and do best in the forthcoming examination. So we are going to start the, the lecture now. And as for advanced medical surgical nursing too. In our online uh, discussions, the course, uh, the course was taken by myself and Mr. Adedoyin. So I would do justice to most of the topics that were discussed during the online facilitation. So try to get yourself settled now while we start the, the lecture. Slides. Okay. In our fourth discussion online, you agree with me that we'll discuss the topic individual and family consideration related to, to illness. So in that particular topic, we're able to go through the concept of anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, nursing implication of patients with depressed, depression, loss, and grief. And finally, we'll discuss assessment of patients with substance abuse. Uh, in our first lecture, for those of you that attended the lecture, you remember that I gave out some assignments and I asked you to read those topics. I want to believe by now those are settled. Uh, and if you have not done it, the opportunity is still there for you within this few days that we have for this uh, preparation towards the online examination. So by this morning, I'm going to speak uh, more on what we have discussed online. So the first thing I will be discussing with you is the concept of anxiety. Let me start by telling you that as nurses, we are the standards for patients coming to the hospital. Most of the time, they must have tried one or two things out and when they discover that those things failed, they end up coming down to the, to the hospital. On coming to the hospital, they come with some level of nervousness, some level of fear, some level of apprehension and worrying of what exactly will be the outcome or the prognosis of this disease condition that I'm bringing to the, to the hospital. So as nurses, we have a responsibility to take. And that is why we must, at all times, suppress our own level of uh, apprehension or fear and be calm as much as possible for us to be able to attend to patients that we have had in mind that they have some level of anxiety coming to the hospital. You agree with me that even ordinary headache, so to say, none can come with some level of anxiety because you might not know some underlying factors, some things that might accompany that uh, headache, but patient himself, even without saying it, he himself knows that there are some things that is going to be revealed while he's presenting the, the data of what has happened to, to him. And with that background, you agree with me that 
we have a role to play as nurses. And that's the reason why we are discussing this topic. I will believe that anxiety, um, the depression, substance abuse, and the lies, they are not new topic to us because we must have discussed it in mental health. So we are not going into details of it in message. All we are just looking at is the aspect of how we can actually, or the standards, our patient come with different forms of anxiety and what we can do as nurses to be able to take care of this or manage this level of uh, anxiety. And with the slide you are seeing, we have anxiety is a general term for several disorders that cause nervousness, fear, apprehension, and worry. This disorder affects how we feel and behave and can cause physical symptoms. When patient comes to, to the hospital with, with malaria, the patient already leaving the relatives at home, it, it gives some level of worry to this patient. So the patient may manifest some level of aggression. And you look at the patient, is it, is it more than this ordinary malaria you are presenting? To you, it might look ordinary. But to the patients that have left some things undone at home because of this uh, malaria, it means so many things to, to this patient. To the patient that is presenting with headache, this patient must have passed through so many agonies. And they are toiling with the emotion of that individual. It can make that individual to come out with some un, un, unforeseen uh, level of uh, reactions. So as nurses, we must understand this. As a matter of fact, there is a saying that any patient coming to the hospital, that individual, until he or she is discharged, the individual is considered not to be well. So if you join your own level of anxiety or apprehension to that of the patient, then the two of you can be considered not to be well. And I want to believe none of us want to fall into that uh, category. So in clinical settings, fear of unknown, what is going to be the prognosis? How will I get money to take care of myself? What happens to my children at home? What happens to my work? This can bring some level of anxiety to the patient. Unexpected news about one's health. A patient has gone for a uh, diagnosis, a particular diagnosis. This patient is expecting the results. Not knowing what is going to be the outcome of that result is enough to give this patient some level of apprehension. And if a patient is coming to the hospital with some level of a, some forms of impairment, this itself can equally engender anxiety. So as nurses, we must watch out for all, all of this. They, this anxiety, sometimes it might be mild. It's, it, it can be something that is un, unnoticeable, but sometimes, you can agree with me that this might come to a paralyzing uh, situation, that the, it will even be more than the condition that the patient is presenting in the, in the hospital. As at the time, it's becoming more escalated to the point of uh, level of uh, panicking by, by the patient, then we can term that as being an incapacitated uh, anxiety. That also requires nurses' uh, intervention. So when patients will have received all of this uh, news that I've said earlier, then we expect this patient to come with some level of anxiety. And for us to be able to know what the patient is displaying, contrary to the primary condition that the patient is presenting in the hospital, there are some indications that you are going to be looking out for. And the first one could be physiologic in nature. It could be emotional in nature and it could be behavioral in, in nature. So all of this we are going to see now, and if you have had patients in the time past that are presented with such, or you will be meeting some that are presenting with some of those things, then as nurses, we should be uh, uh, ready to take care of some of those uh, signs and symptoms that patients will be presenting when they are presenting any disease uh, condition. Up to this point, I want to believe I'm communicating to you. If yes is your answer, then we can move on. The physiological indicators. One, it could be 
appetite change, change in appetites. It could be one of the uh, physiologic indicators. You, are, you, 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 you ask yourself, a patient that is presenting with hypertension, how come you are not able to eat? You have had patients saying, I even lost appetite of eating anything. I don't, I don't just feel like eating anything. This, if traced properly, may be a physiological indicator for a level of anxiety being experienced by the patient. Then it could be headaches, muscle tension, fatigue or lethargy, weight change, cold and the flu symptoms. It could be digestive upset. On mere hearing of some unpleasant news by some patient, even as we as individual, you rush to toilet several times. And people ask you, what's the connection between the news you are that, that is being broken to you and running down to the toilet? The answer simply is there is anxiety coming to play for this patient. Grinding of teeth can be another indicator. Palpitation is another physiological sign that we can watch out for in this patient. Are you with me? So the another indicator is emotional indicator, which could present in form of forgetfulness. You ask patients, but you said this thing has been happening to you. How long has it happened? Because I can't even remember anything. Now the onus lie on you as a nurse to be able to use your sense of uh, professional judgment to be able to bring out some facts, even when patients cannot remember anything as a result of uh, anxiety. Another signs that you watch out for as emotional indicators is low productivity, feeling, the patient may be feeling dust, there may be poor concentration. You are asking the patient question, is directing his attention or diverting his attention to another thing else. That may be a sign of anxiety. You are asking for when did this edit start? And the patient is, is telling you about how he's going to get money to treat the headache. You know, there are two things, there are two parallel things that doesn't correlate as at that time you're asking that question. But because the patient does not know how he's going to get out of that problem, he's thinking beyond what you're asking him. And that could be watched out for as a sign of emotional indicator for anxiety. Then for uh, negative attitude, nurses, this is not new to us in the hospital. You see patient displaying some negative attitude. If you are not well composed or you are not mature professionally, you might be tempted to react to the negative attitude of the patient. Ask some patients ordinary to go and pay for this. They will think as if this money is coming to your pocket. And they, some may even attempt to even slap the, the, the nurse. So, but you as nurses that have understood that for every patient, irrespective of how mild or severe the condition is, there must be some level of negative attitude that patient will come in with because it's a form of grief to, to the patient as at that very uh, particular point in time. Confusion is another uh, emotional indicator. Wily mind, a, a loss of concentration. The patient is, a, a, is, is not interested in what you are saying. You are saying I, you're saying D. No new ideas about what is happening currently to that patient. Then boredom could be another uh, indicator that you can watch out for. Then the last one is relational or behavioral indicators, which could include isolate, isolation, intolerance, resentment, loneliness, nagging, distrust. What I want to what, what I want you all to learn from this, all these indicators, is that the more you know them the more you will be able to interact well professionally to the level of bringing an holistic, uh, giving an holistic care to your patients in the hospital. But if you yourself, you have failed to recognize this and patients are coming to the hospital, you see them as a normal human being, then you might fall victim of reacting the same way the patient is reacting and the two of you may be considered being sick at the same time. So we must get this understanding that every patient comes to the hospital, they come with one level of anxiety or the other, which require nurses to understand, and that gives us an insight to what we are going to do for this patient. 
Another topic that we discuss is post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Have you ever asked yourself that a patient that you don't even know anything about what happened to him as at the time he had that accident, he just comes to you and that patient begins to express some level of aggression. Or you ask the question, Madam, why are you so, so depressed? You are coming with headache, but yet you are depressed. Underline, underline what the, the expression of that human. If you, you, if you go into the details of it, you understand that this patient might have suffered from one thing or the other before, that the patient is now recapitulating, is now bringing it back to his memory. And with that in mind, the patient may be experiencing what we call post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. And that is why on the slide you are seeing, it says it's a condition that generates waves of anxiety. It's like a ripple effect. You throw a, uh, a, a stone in a water. You can only know when it starts. When it, when it starts dropping into that water, the length of wave that that stone will generate, you may not be able to tell. In fact, you may not be able to quantify it. And that is how it looks for every patient that will have presented with one disease condition or the other at one point in time, and now coming to you even without your knowledge because of that devastating experience that the patient have had from that uh, condition, the patient may still be bringing the, the, the mindset of what has happened to him to bear as at that point in time that it's coming with another different disease condition. So it will come with anger. You see the patient, so, so because I'm amputated, that is why you are talking to me like that. Whereas you're not actually talking to him based on the level of amputation. But because the patient felt that at that point in time, someone wants to make a jest of him because of the amputation, the patient is expected to show some level of, uh, or display some level of anger, aggression, depression, and uh, being suspicious. The patient, the patient feels that everybody is against him. At every point in time, this car that is in my body, they are looking at it because there is car in my body. Whereas nobody is actually focusing his or attention on, on him. It's a condition that threatens a person's sense of self. Let me give you an example of a patient that does suffer from bones. This patient has recovered the leftover of the scars of these bones. As any day the patient is looking at his face, and he's seeing that scar. The patient is tempted to display some level of either depression, aggression, nervousness, that why should it be me? Why can't, why can't it be another person? So there is loss of uh, uh, self worth at that point in time. That's what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. And it will interfere with the daily functioning of this patient. If, even when patient can do it, Effect that he could not do it. Effect that that is uh, that is incapacitated. Then it could be said to be a physiological response of people who have been severely traumatized, including increased activities of the sympathetic nervous system, increased plasma catecholamide levels, and increased urinary epinephrine and non epinephrine level. What we are saying here is the moment there is post-traumatic stress disorder, there is every tendency that all these substances, they, they, they are bound to, 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 to be elevated. And the moment that happens, it triggers some level of, level of anxiety, some level of anger uh, in these patients. People with post-traumatic stress may lose the ability to control their response to, to stimuli. You wonder, madam, why are you behaving like this? But what I've said is not more that is it's not up to what the, the behavior you are displaying. What has happened to that individual is that if you dig deep into what the patient, how the patient is feeling, it might be because the patient has suffered from one problem or the other before, in which by the time you continue your interaction with the patient, you get to know that there is an underlying problem with this patient. Then that uh, the symptoms of this post-traumatic stress disorder can occur 
hours to year after the trauma is experienced. I've said that that it could be acute in 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 in, in, in type, as experience of symptoms may not last more than three months. The patient has had bones the the first day. And within that three months, the patient may be displaying what we call this all the signs of a post-traumatic stress disorder. Why should it be me? What have I done to God? Are people looking at me as being bad? Is it my sin that has caused this? And with that, the patient dissociates himself from the reality of the normal environment. It could be, it will be chronic in type. And the symptoms of this chronic post-traumatic stress disorder may last longer than three months. There's no amount of drugs, there's no amount of psycho psychological therapy you may give to this patient. The patient will still be nursing this grief within his or her mind. So you should bear that in mind as a nurse. In the case of the lay post-traumatic stress disorder, it could be over six months. So you watch out for the symptoms, but this thing has happened to you for long. Madam, you ought to have overcome the, 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 uh, the, the effect of this condition. And the patient is telling you, it's like you don't know what that thing has done to me. What the patient is trying to tell you is that it's a delayed post-traumatic stress disorder. I want to believe you are noting some of these points. Remember the exam you've been doing is, is exams that covers different types of uh, uh, questions. So I won't say more than that. Just master or note some of those uh, key points, then what should be your response as, as nurses when you have patients that are coming with this? Number one, the nurses should consider which of their patients are at risk for post-traumatic stress disorder and be knowledgeable about the common symptoms associated with it. So as a nurse, you want to know a patient that suffers from uh, amputation, trauma, or any form of a uh, disease condition, this also patient will come up with this also condition. I've, I've told you about the example of, uh, of bones. This individual, anytime he's looking at that scar, he knows that there is a problem. And as nurses, you must understand that. So when patient is with anger, depression, aggression, then you should not be worried. All you needed to do is just to bring your professional expert to bear and calm the patient down. Then other people are more susceptible to this physical effect of trauma than the, the younger one. So you should understand that because as they grow, they grow older, what comes to their mind is, this thing has not happened to me when I was young. Why now? In fact, some of them will tell you that I prefer to even die than to be nursing this also particular condition. Nurses, we have responsibility at this point to be able to take care of these people as long as they are still alive. They are worthy of living a normal life. So you should be ready to do what is expected as, as nurses. Then the treatment option for, for this patient. Basically, it's expected of you to establish a sound and therapeutic relationship with these patients. Let them trust you. That's whatever information they give to you. You are not likely going to give that information out to anybody. So as soon as patients understand that, they are ready to speak out their minds. And at any other time, even when you are not asking questions, they, they want to give you information about their previous disease condition that they have suffered from. And with that, they are not likely going to be dis displaying any unnecessary form of uh, uh, aggression. Then as a nurse, you should be able to address and walk through the trauma experience. Ask questions of how it started. What happened? What causes it? What are the, what, 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 what are the patients been doing since it has started? And what can you offer as what, what has been done to that patient since he has been passing through that disease uh, condition? So as nurses, you ask all of these questions. You become, you know, initially we said you establish a trusting relationship. It is only when you have this, this sound relationship that you can 
sit down with the patient and be able to work along with whatever the patient is presenting. And another thing that you should be put in mind is that you should be able to teach this patient, having known the detailed information about this uh, patient, you teach the patient of how he can cope with the, uh, uh, the condition he found himself, how he can take care of himself. So you should be able to be ready to do this for this patient, especially the older ones that felt that it shouldn't have been this time that it happened to me, or the most younger ones that felt that, what can I do again with my life if this has happened to me? Then lastly, as, as nurses, you should be ready to monitor the progress of, of this patient, physically and emotionally. If the patient is coming with problem of this is what has happened to me as a result of this also the disease condition you have asked detail you know what is happening you have given the patient even if you are amputated with one leg you have a car and you feel that you can't drive that car you can still drive it as long as you can go for automatic uh, car then with every other condition every other uh, physical and uh, emotional presentation the patient is coming with as nurses you will still be able to go around those uh, uh, explanations and be able to give detailed uh, care to this uh, patient. Then another thing that we'll discuss here is, uh, I'm not seeing this screen. Sorry. All right, sorry for the break in transmission. We'll continue with uh, chronic illness and disability. That's another condition we discuss. So on that, that uh, topic, we discuss chronic conditions, phases of chronic conditions, and implication of disability for nursing, nursing practice. I want you to bear in mind that chronic illnesses, when we talk about chronic illnesses, what we are talking about is a condition that has affected this patient for so long a time that he has taken so, so many measures, he has attempted to treat himself, he has gone to several hospitals, but this patient felt that this condition still remains, or it takes a longer period of time for that condition to be solved. And most of the time, when we talk about this chronic condition, it may persist for long. Or we say uh, it can go on and on, that the patient will continue to manage that uh, condition. So it is imperative to mention here that chronic illness and disability affect people of all ages, be it younger ones, the middle age, and the very old. So nobody is exempted from this. And you must bear in, it in mind that you can have different categories of these uh, people coming to the hospital and your responsibility as nurses is to take care of these people. Chronic kidneys and disability are found in all ethnic, cultural, and racial groups. So it's not a function of where I come from or the religion I practice. That is not what dictates whether you're going to end up with chronic illnesses and uh, disability. Some may even occur in some group of people. So when we have the idea of that as nurses, we have responsibility, we'll get to that. Then chronic disease occurs in all social economic groups, but people who have low incomes uh, and disadvantaged background are more likely to report poor health. You agree with me on this point, that for those that does not have the where with, where without, the, the means of getting themselves treated of any condition they find them, themselves. Let's take, for example, diabetics is an example of chronic disease. These patients it will continue to patronize all the all forms of herbalists, alpha, pastors, 
for, for him to get treated until it gets worse. That's when you see the patient reporting the hospital. And the later effects may be for the patient to go for amputation. You should not abuse that patient for coming at that very particular point in time. What has happened to that individual is it may be as a result of him coming from disadvantaged background. He doesn't have the financial capacity to actually take care of that condition. So that is what we can term chronic uh, condition. There are some factors that factors that affect these chronic uh, conditions. It could be poverty, it could be inadequate uh, health insurance, and we can see that being prominent in our areas. Poverty is a serious issue that, and most of these disease conditions, people that it will affect may be the poorer ones. And when they don't have the money, they are likely to come out with chronic, some conditions that have led to some level of chronicity. It's not as if those conditions wouldn't have been tackled at the early stage, but because many of them don't have the financial capability to actually take care of it. So they come out with it. Imagine asking somebody that is not feeding on one dollar per day to go for mammography. The individual will not go for it. There is no amount of advice you give to that individual. It would be far to go to one church and ask for the indulgence of one pastor to pray for him. Because he knows that at the end of the day, nobody is ready to take care of that. And to make the matter worse, the government does not have any provision for the poorer ones in terms of health insurance. Even those that are doing it, most of the time, you agree with me, those of you that are working in health, they are fake. Because they will tell you there are some conditions that you cannot treat with health insurance. And if you, if you do go to them for that, they will have to, you have to go and bring money. And this guy does not have money. So the individual will have to, call, to succumb to just staying at home or looking for alternative therapy to take care of, of himself. Chronic conditions are often defined as medical condition or health problem with associated symptoms or disability that require long-term management. So it could go as far as three months or even more than three months. When you are treating a particular condition, it goes within that duration. It could be termed as chronic uh, condition. There are illnesses that have a prolonged cause. They do not resolve spontaneously. And the cures for this uh, condition, they, they are not easily come by. They are very rare. You may not be able to get this most of the time. I, I've had causes to, to tell some people that will say, I have hypertension. They have afraid on it, have used dogs, they've discharged me, and they've said it has gone. I've had reasons to tell them that no, hypertension doesn't go. The moment it starts, it continues like that, you continue to manage it. The only thing that, that you can do is that, is that you can suppress, you may reduce the, the, the blood pressure, but that it will go on else, uh, finally. No, it won't, you, you only need to wait for some triggering factor it will come back again. Or not going for the treatment that's supposed to go for, it will surely come back again. So, but as, as, a, as nurses, we must put this in mind, that these people that comes with some of these conditions, they need help. And we must be ready to render this help at one point or the other. Then management of chronic condition includes learning to live with symptoms. Or disability and coming to terms with identity changes resulting from having a chronic condition. We must sit our patients down that this diabetes you are nursing. What you need to understand about it is that this thing may live with you for some longer period of time or even for the rest of your life. And when that happens, that is not a death sentence. All you need to do is to follow the um, professional advice that has been given to you. Come for the checkup as expected, use the, your drug as you have been given or you have been directed. All of this will prevent the escalation of this chronic condition. Then it is also consisting of carrying out the lifestyle changes and regimen designed to 
control symptoms, and prevent complications. In managing chronic condition, it will involve both the nurses, the patients, and even the significant others to actually sit with this patient. Or oh, I've been smoking, then smoking, I should be away with smoking. Drinking should not be part of my life again. This patient, most of them may not be able to do it by themselves alone. Somebody needs to be with them. You are giving them the necessary advice that they need to, to get. I hope you are following me. Up to this, uh, we have discussed anxiety, disability, and neglectedness, and post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. All right, we are moving. Having talked about what chronic conditions are, then we need to know what are the causes of these chronic conditions. The following are the causes of the chronic conditions. One, it will come from infectious diseases like uh, smallpox, diphtheria, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, and even COVID-19 that we are currently battling with. So, Chronic conditions can come from it as a result of the complications that develop from most of these infectious diseases. Lifetime, lifestyle factor is another uh, cause. In terms of you are good in smoking, you can come down with chronic condition. You involve yourself in chronic stress, a lot of, a lot of stress. Many of those people that involve themselves in this stress may not know the effects now until the later life of their living on heads. That's when they will understand what they have been doing to themselves. Then sedentary lifestyle, as much as it's good to have money, you must exercise yourself. As much as it's good to sit under AC and send people on errand, you must also involve yourself on daily exercises. The moment you fail to do that, the implication of that may be so, so devastating. And as nurses, you must put this in mind that giving that education in this direction is key to what we are having at hand presently, that people have been asked to stay at home. So many are not doing anything. And for them not to come down with chronic illnesses, we need to give this education that they must do uh, something to exercise their body on a daily basis. Then it will come as a, a risk of a other chronic health problems like respiratory disease, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. Then longer lifespan. You have been praying to God that you want to spend 200 years on health. There is no crime about that, but you should know that the longer you stay on health, the more depreciating your health will become. So if an individual is staying longer on health, the individual comes down with so many chronic uh, uh, conditions. Then another one is a uh, cancer and all that I mentioned on your own. They can lead to chronic uh, conditions. I hope you are following. All right, we, we move to the characteristics of chronic illness. Characteristics of chronic, what do they present with? How do you recognize that this is a chronic condition? I'll just mention your four points here. You have like more than seven, eight, nine points on, in, in your notes. So go and take note of it, of it. One is managing chronic illness involves more than treating medical problems. To manage chronic illness is more than I have malaria, or I've come down with headache. It goes beyond that. It's something that patient may have to stay 
for long, longer than necessary in the hospital. So any condition that is presenting with that, it has turned to a chronic uh, condition. Number two, chronic conditions usually involve many different phases over the course of a person's lifestyle, lifetime. So when we say this condition is a chronic condition, then it will be moving from the patient come down today, tomorrow it becomes well, and at another time it couldn't stand up again. That disease condition will become a chronic, uh, a chronic condition. So you should, you should note that. Another one is keeping chronic condition under control requires persistent adherence to therapeutic regimen. For example, I've given you an example of diabetes. A patient that, that has come down with diabetes, even though that individual has been treated, the moment the, the individual decides to be eating too much of sugar again, or decides to be living the normal sedentary life he has been living before, there's every tendency that the individual will come down with that disease condition again. So when we say this is chronic condition, nurses, we need to tell our patient that these do's and don'ts, you must follow it strictly. And that will make the patient to be free of the chronic condition. So any condition that involves giving criteria of do this, don't do that. Because it can resurface again. That condition could be likened to chronic condition. And then the last one is, one chronic disease can lead to the development of other chronic condition. I want you to take a minute where you are sit seated and ask yourself, what are those conditions that when this happens, it can lead to others? So do that by yourself and answer it within yourself. We have the phases of chronic conditions. Uh, we have like nine phases in your notes. They are going to explain like four or thereabouts here now. So go and read the nine phases. They are very important. Number one, we have the pre-trajectory phase. When we talk about pre-trajectory phase, what we are saying here is that the patient has not manifested too much of the uh, symptoms or it has not created some level of risk to this patient. For example, a patient that is just coming with diabetes and patient is telling you that this thing, I've been having it and I take coke all the time. I eat whatever I like. It's because that individual has not suffered from the chronicity of that disease condition. And at that point, we can call it a pre-trajectory phase. So no risk has developed from this condition that the patient is suffering from. And the patient at another point in time may be susceptible to chronic uh, chronicity of this uh, condition. Number two, we have trajectory phase. This is characterized by onset of symptoms or disability associated with a chronic uh, condition. The patient has started presenting serious uh, symptoms for this patient. For example, let's still go back to that uh, uh, diabetes. Already the patient has developed stuff that refused to go. He has treated this so many times and it's, it, it's like it's not getting better. This patient is at the trajectory phase because the symptoms are now obvious and it requires serious uh, attention. The number three point is the stable phase of the trajectory. This indicates that symptoms and disability are being managed adequately. So the patient understood the reality now and he has come down to the hospital to seek for care. So at this point, we can call it a stable phase of the tragedy. Stability here means that the patient is in the hand of healthcare practitioner that can give the required care to this condition as at that point in time. In other words, the healthcare practitioner can halt the progression of this condition at this time. So we can term it as stable phase of a trajectory of chronic conditions. And the last one that I'll be telling you here is the unstable phase. The symptoms become more exacerbated, even despite the care that is being given to this patient. You know, one thing is to be in safe hands, getting the required medications, and even at that, 
you discover that the symptom is not uh, getting reduced on, on daily basis. So at this point, we can term it to be an unstable phase. So during this phase, a, a person, every, person's every activities may be temporarily disrupted because symptoms are not well uh, controlled. So nothing can be done. The activities of daily living will have been halted at this point. So other phases, as you have in your notes, are the acute phase, the crisis phase, the combat phase, the downward phase, and lastly, the, the, dying, the dying phase. Up to this point, I want to believe I'm communicating. If yes is your answer, kindly answer that within your mind, and let's continue. We move on to disability. Disability. Ask yourself, am I disabled? The question can be answered by everybody, either yes or no. But I want to assure you, in one form or the other, every one of us as human beings or not, we are disabled. Some there's may be financial disability. Some there's may be psychological disability. And some there's may be physiological disability. But where, uh, whichever way it appears to you, the point that I want to bring out this morning is that disability exists. Disabilities can cover all, uh, all, uh, all um, types of human beings. I mean, all, all, all the ages and either irrespective of your tribe, your religion, and the likes. So a person is considered to have a disability, such as limitation in performance or function in everyday activities, if he or she has difficult, difficulty in talking, hearing, seeing, walking, climbing stairs, lifting or carrying objects, performing activities of daily living, doing school work, or working at a job. So anybody that fall under this characteristics can be termed to be disabled. If you are still not seeing phobia up to this point of how technological driven exam will be conducted, then that individual that the individual is disabled because already you are not going on with all the activities and the tutorial that has been given to you on this technology driven exam. Although this disability can be corrected, if only you can calm your mind down. So you remember I said, every one of us, we are disabled in one form or the other. WHO asked this to say about disability. He said, it's an umbrella term for impairment, activity limitation, and participation restriction. An individual that has one deformity or the other, the individual could be termed disabled. An individual that could not go on with the normal daily activities, probably because of one limitation or the other. They are paying for data to attend lecture. I don't have money to buy data. You are disabled. So, and in any way that disability can be corrected, then you cannot participate because of one difficulty or the other. Some are still struggling to join it now. Those ones are disabled in one form or the other. So that is what WHO called disability. A person with disability can also be said to be one who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. I think we have said this, it could be physical, it could be the one that you cannot even see. So, and that's why it's difficult to say, Mr. A is disabled, Mr. B is not disabled. So every one of us could be considered to be disabled in one form or the other, as long as it's has to do with physical, mental, or mental uh, impairment or a person that has a record of such impairment at one point or the other number one you can say for example you say somebody has had amputation done or you look at your hand from bed and discover you, you discover that something is missing somewhere then the individual could have been disabled one form or the other as we progress in this discussion we understand that there is developmental disability. Many of us are disabled from the develop developmental stage. And that is what is affecting us in those aspects that we are feeling it now. 
So disability is a serious issue that we need to look into. Then it could be regarded as having such an impairment that you yourself cannot even imagine. But if somebody else outside there that will point out to you that, Madam, you know you have this problem. And Madam, you explain your, your life or you look at it by yourself. You understand that truly there's a serious disadvantage here compared to the way others are behaving. Disability can be categorized into developmental disability, acquired disability, and age-related disability. I'm going to take them one after the other. Developmental disability. From the word developmental, you were all part of the class of a developmental psychology. At every stage of human life, we are expected to develop to some certain level of a or, 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 or of, of, of uh, activities in life. We are expected to do one or two things. Inability to be able to do those things has put on us some level of a uh, disability. Developmental disability can occur at any time from birth to 22 years of life. So if there's anything missing from birth, even from conception to 22 years of life, that could be termed developmental disability. It could be in terms of mental health, it could be in terms of physical health, it could be in terms of speech. Some of us cannot speak correctly till now. That could have been as a result of what has happened to us during our developmental stages. And you remember the Eric, Eric, Eric Sinter theory. The moment there is a fixation at any particular stage of life, the individual can carry it out throughout life. And that could be termed developmental disability. In terms of cognition, the way some of us comprehend things differs. Someone to you teach them from morning to daybreak, they will not understand. It is not them. It could be as a result of what has happened to them in utero or why they are alive and they are developing. And some things were not falling in place as they ought to fall in place. It could be in terms of language. See, now, there, there is no how anybody can teach me Hausa language. I won't be able to speak it. I've tried it several Whereas some people just in that condition or in that environment, for a few days, you will see them speaking that language. To me, that is a developmental uh, uh, disability. In terms of self-care, some are disabled in that aspect. You have heard there is a Yoruba uh, saying that said Obunleniji. When Yoruba says Obunlenya, that this person is a dirty individual. What Yoruba is saying is that the individual has a disability, and it could be as a result of the upbringing, the environment the individual found himself or he developed from that could necessitate uh, that. So another example of developmental disability could be spinal bifida, as you see in. A, a child that is during in utero that didn't take the required uh, folic acid that the woman supposed to take, the individual can come down with a, with developmental disability or spinal bifida, and that could be a serious problem because it has serious and significant impact on the brain of of the of the baby. Then cerebral palsy could be a developmental disability. Down syndrome and muscular dystrophy can be a developmental. Uh, disability. Some people, the way they are limp, limp, limping their hands or legs, to now, is not their making. It will be as a result of what happened to them between birth and 22 years of, of age. Number two, we have acquired disability. This may occur as a result of acute and sudden injury. Many of us will have had accidents, accidents at one point or the other. That could be a serious uh, cause of a uh, disability. I'm going to show you something now. Look at, look at my hand. My hand was not like this when I was born. But as a result of an accident, I sustained this injury, which has made it not to be the normal uh, texture of, my, of, of a normal hand. So this is an acquired disability. And... There is not any human being can do about that. It's a natural event 
that, that occurs. So we are saying that acquired disability could be something that occurs to you, acute or sudden or mainly, you did not prepare for it. It could be in times of a brain injury. It could be in times of a amputation that's happened uh, to you. That is disability. So we also have an acute non-traumatic disorders like stroke, myocardial infarction can lead to the acquired disability. Progression of the chronic disorders like arthritis, multiple sclerosis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, blindness due to disability, and diabetic retinopathy will be an, a good example of acquired disability. And the last one is age-related disability. There are those that are called in the elderly population and thought to be due to aging process. So this is strictly due to aging process. We will have seen our elderly ones complaining of osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, or they couldn't hear very well. They couldn't see very well. This is a good example of age-related disability because it does not start with them from their uh, primary stage of life, but as they are aging, they continue, the body system continues to depreciate or, and they begin to manifest some of these symptoms of some of these conditions that we have uh, mentioned. You, I want to believe you know all of those uh, conditions. So those are the three types of disability. For repetition's sake, I said developmental disability, acquired disability, and age-related disability. Other forms of disability that you can talk about or types of disability are sensory disabilities. This affects the sense of hearing or vision. Learning disability, this affects the ability to learn, remember, or concentrate. So if you have problem with concentrating in the class, it's a disability. So tell the individual that is complaining of, I couldn't just understand what they are teaching. Every time he doesn't understand, is a serious disability that needed to be addressed. Then we have a disability that affects the ability to speak or communicate. Some cannot speak fluently. Even the way I'm speaking, some can speak better than the way I'm speaking. And to, to, to them, my own is disability. So, but I can assure you that in every disability, there can always be ability. So you can bring out ability from disability. It depends on how you manage that disability. But the moment you look at yourself that you can't come out of that condition again, then you, you, you have limited yourself and you have confined yourself to that disability for life. So disability can affect ability to work, shop, care for oneself, or obtain health care. That could be another form of a disability. I hope we, we are learning. All right? So we can move, we can move on now. We, have, we are moving to oncology nursing now. I want, to, I want to give you one minute to just reflect back on what we learned in oncology nursing and what should be our responsibility as nurses. When we say oncology nursing, we are talking about cancer care, cancer nursing, caring for patients with cancer, or that has developed one tumor or the other. And it would be very good for us to understand what cancers are, for us to be able to know the care we can give to this patient. Cancer is not a single disease with a single cause. Rather, it is a good, a group of distinct diseases with different causes, manifestation, treatment, and prognosis. So cancer is not something that is caused by just one single factor. There are so many conglomerates, conglomerate of uh, factors that come to form uh, cancer. And this could manifest in different form. And the treatment and prognosis, they are not the same like it happens to every other disease condition. Then cancer nursing care covers all age groups and nursing specialties and is carried out in a variety of health care. When we say cancer nursing, you can be in gynecology unit and yet you will still be treating cancer. You can be in medical unit and you'll be treating cancer. 
you can you are even being in psychiatry units and you have patient that is presenting with cancer. So every one of us needs to have the knowledge of how to take care of cancer patients and what cancers are. So settings where we can take care of cancers will include even home, community, acute care institution, patient rehabilitation centers, and even long-term care facilities. Let's quickly look at the epidemiology of cancer. So I'm going to summarize this. I won't be giving details. You have opportunity of reading more on cancer. But for us to be able to appreciate what we are discussing, it should be good for us to know some uh, data about this uh, condition. Although cancer affects people of all ages, most cancer occur in people older than 65 years of age. So cancer can affect even a younger child. Cancer can affect a middle-aged man. But most of the time, it has been believed that cancer affects people with 65 years uh, old and above. And that does not mean that, don't get me wrong, that does not mean that people below that age cannot have cancer. So overall, the incidence of cancer is higher in men than in women, and higher in industrial sector and nations. You, are, you are understand what I mean by this. When we say it's higher in men, we are saying that men are more prone to so many factors that could necessitate uh, cancer condition compared to, to women. Of course, we have some cancer that are specifically meant for or associated with gender of uh, women. And for the mere fact that men are the one that works in the industrial sectors, they go out to, to get out their family with heat and the likes, they are exposed to so many radiations that could predispose them to cancer condition. Then we said cancer is second only to cardiovascular disease as leading cause of death in the United States. We are taking United States as a reference uh, point because taking any data, is that you talk about US or Europe or even Asian country, and when we're able to get that data, we can delineate it down to our own continent. So in United States, we are saying that when you pick cardiovascular diseases, then the next condition you'll be talking about that kills people or that brings people down to their nail is cancer condition, not even COVID-19. Cancer has become a major source of morbidity and mortality globally. And you, are, you, are, you understand why this is so. As we continue to expose ourselves to some of the food we eat this day, that are different from what our old mamas and papas eat, then, then you can agree with me that we are likely to be exposed to more cancer conditions than uh, we, we are expected. Even some uh, materials that we use this day, researchers have found out that some of these things contain carcinogenic uh, substances that can lead us to, to cancer. So a few countries in the, in the world have data of cancer incidents. So we may not be able to get much about those that come with cancer, because some actually know it, but they don't come out to the open that they have cancer. Some 100,000 new cases of cancer occur every year with high case fatality ratio. And you agree with me, I've said it earlier, I don't know whether it's in your class or so. All this attitude of eating canned food all the time, they expose us to more cancer than, than we expected. So I will always subscribe to eat, eating natural because I'm a natural man. So you must eat more of natural food, live in more of natural environment if you don't want to expose yourself to cancer uh, condition. And with that, we move to the pathophysiology of malignant process. Before I go to the particular malignant process, it will be very important for us to note that cells in our body, they are expected to, to grow, they are expected to differentiate, they are expected to form another cells as they are dying or as one injury or the other happening to them. When we talk about cancer condition, we are talking about a condition whereby 
The seed are supposed to grow normally, has decided to be growing in an abnormal way, or there is what we call a genetic mode, probably from another associating, uh, associating shell, uh, cells. So cancer can start almost everywhere in human body, which could trigger some millions of cells to actually proliferate uncontrollably. Normally, human cells grow and divide to form new cells as the body needs them. But when cells grow old or become damaged, they die and new cells take their place. But in cancer condition, this is not the process. When cancer develops, this orderly process breaks down. And as cells become small and more abnormal, old or damaged cells survive when they should die and new cells form when they are not needed. So these extra cells can develop without stopping and may form growth called a tumor. Let me quickly break it down for you for you to understand it better. When we talk about particular malignant cancer, what I need from you to initially explain to me is for you to tell me what do, what do you mean by cancer? And having known that, bring out to the understanding that human cells are expected to, to grow as they are being damaged or as they are, being, as they are getting older and they are expected to be replaced by another cells. But in a situation where this line of process is broken, then an individual may have some associating uh, or uh, uh, some uh, genetic uh, mutation happening whereby another cell from another uh, entire part of the body may join with the other one that's supposed not to join, that is supposed not to join with, and that can bring the individual to having a cancer. And when this happens, it's, it is called abnormal uh, tumor growth. We can see this in cancer of the blood, cancer of, uh, of the bones, and, and the lice. But you must have this at the back of your mind that even as much as we have many solid tumors, there are some tumors that are not solid. And we can see that in the cancer of, of the blood. I think you understand the process. So the moment you're able to give us that process, all you need to give me back is what are the likely clinical manifestations that comes down with this uh, cancer. You agree with me that whether malignant uh, or benign tumor, there is a proliferation, there is an expansion beyond where they are expected to be. And with that, there can be compression on some other shaking uh, organs. This individual, as this is happening, you know, we are talking about proliferation, there's more blood there versus. Being, being grown, and you can see that with this, any little puncture or any little injury can lead to bleeding to that individual, or hyperproliferation can lead to that. So that is what you should understand about the particular level of, uh, of cancer. Then I need to tell you that cancer manifests in, in different forms. When you go through your notes, you will see that it could be in form of hyperplasia, uh, uh, neoplasia and the lice. You see the four uh, major types that you can see there as the uh, types of uh, cancer that you can see in in the body. All right. Uh, finally, on cancer, I need to talk about tumor staging and a tumor grading. Tumor staging and tumor grading. Uh, for many of us that are working in the hospital, many a times you'll have seen doctors writing some, some medical jargons. They can write in terms of alphabet, in terms of a number, and when they are writing this, what they are doing is just to give a particular diagnosis or level or stage or grade of, of tumor. And this can be understood by the time you have this knowledge of what we are discussing today. So a complete diagnosis or evaluation of any cancer can be done only, I mean, majorly through stage, staging and, uh, and grading. 
and treatment option can be gotten from that as well. So when we say staging, we are talking about the size of the tumor and the existence of local invasion and distant metastasis. So staging, here it's in mind, is synonymous to the size of the tumor. The, we can have example of this uh, staging to be in form of, uh, I mean, looking at the tumor nodes, the tumor, whether it affects some associated nodes, whether it affects, whether it has metastasized, whether it has uh, affected the, the lymph node. So that's what we look at for in a uh, staging. When we say cancer staging, we are talking about dividing it into two major stages, the clinical stage and the patho pat pathological stage. When we say clinical stage, clinical stage is based on all of the available information obtained from a surgery to remove the tumor. And this information may be gotten from physical examination, blood test, radiological examination, biopsy, and uh, endoscopy. So when these are done, what they are trying to get is to get to, I mean, to know the clinical staging of this, of this uh, cancer. We will understand it better as we go on. Then we have the pathological uh, stage. This also involves the pathologist taking the sample of the cancer, majorly during surgery, and culture it to know whether it's going to be a malignant or a benign uh, tumor. Then we have grading. Tumor grade is the description of a tumor based on how abnormal the tumor cells and the tumor till you look under the microscope. It is an indicator of how quickly a tumor is likely to grow and spread. If the cell of the tumor and the organization of the tumor's tissue are close to those of normal cells and till you, the tumor is called well differentiated. So when we say cancer grading, all we are looking at is the, the description of how the tumor looks like. You know, the, the staging we said, the, the size. But having known the size, how does it look like? That's when we look at for in, in grading. And this grading system differs. You can see some grading system where they will be using numbers. Some may be using uh, letters for the, the grading. Go and read that in your in your notes. So and during the facilitation, I gave you this that this type of a grading. That when you see a doctor writing GS, what they mean is that that cannot be assessed. This cancer cannot be assessed for now. That you cannot actually say this is a cancer or not. The one is G1, then we can say it is well, that it is not well pronounced, but anybody may looking at it or examine it via microscope can say this is a cancer. Then another one is G2, that is moderately differentiated. So it's between being normal and we have to how we are following. Then, basically, how do we manage cancer? Treatment options for cancers patients should be based on treatment goal for each specific type of cancer. The range of possible treatment goals may include complete elimination of malignant disease, prolonged survival and containment of cancer cells growth, or relief of symptoms associated with the, the disease. But most of the time, cancer treatments, they are always a... Uh, most of the cancer treatments are complex palliative, but a variety of options are actually available for treatment of cancer, and it's really from, it could be surgery, it could be uh, radiation, it's, it could be in form of uh, chemotherapy, and there are some other targeted uh, uh, therapy that can be given to this uh, patient throughout the treatment. As the symptoms are presenting, you are 
attacking that uh, symptoms. A patient is coming with it. I hope you are following. I'll quickly rush through the care of patients with upper respiratory tract disorders. And I won't take much time on this because that's exactly what we are battling with now in the country. So I'm going to pick just only rhinitis. So when we say upper respiratory tract infection, we're talking about infection that affects the, the nose, the paranasal sinuses, but pharynx, larynx, trachea, or uh, bronchi. And most of the time, this condition, they are relatively minor. They may affect us as being mild or temporary. And I can assure you that there is no one of us that has ever experienced this condition before. One of our actually track infection or, or the other in his or her lifetime. But let's bear it in mind that this condition can be devastating sometimes. I've seen patients with rhinitis alone, and it's like as if the life is ending for them. So don't let us look at it from the angle of being mild and temporary alone. We have upper respiratory infection that are mostly caused by illness and affect most people on several occasions. Some of these infections could be acute. It could come with symptoms that can last several days. Others are chronic in nature. So you should note that. But irrespective of how these conditions are presented, whether acute or chronic, patients at one point or the other, they come to the hospital to present themselves with this condition. And you agree with me that upper respiratory tract infection, as we'll be discussing rhinitis today, that it is not just a mild condition again, as it is a key symptom of a COVID-19 uh, uh, condition. So we should take care of it as we are saying. As a matter of fact, if any patient is sneezing beside you, then you should not take it so lightly. This may be a serious sign of a COVID-19. Upper respiratory infections occurs when microorganisms such as viruses and bacteria are inhaled. So it could be, it could come from virus, it could come from bacteria. When it comes from virus, it's most devastating. And the best treatment you can offer to this patient is symptomatic treatment. Because most of the time, you may not get the right antiviral drugs to actually attack this uh, condition. There are many causative organisms that may also be associated with this condition. So you should, you should note that. About 90% of upper respiratory tract disorders stem from viral infection of upper respiratory passages and subsequent mucous membrane inflammation. When we say upper respiratory tract infection, the target is the mucous membrane. And the moment those virus or bacteria affect the mucous membrane in the upper respiratory tract infection, what's the aftermath effect is serious inflammation. And that is why you see uh, of uh, serious running nose because the goblet cell has been seriously affected. Ordinarily, when it's supposed to be producing on a normal or in a normal way, then there is a triggering factor, which is the the foreign bodies now trying to inflame the the goblet uh, cells, and with that you can have serious upper respiratory uh, respiratory symptoms. On average, adults typically develop two or four upper respiratory tract infection per year. So it's not a question of, I've never had it before. There is none of us that will not have one of our street tract infection or the other, at least one or two times in a year. But the studies have said that at least four times in a year, many of us will have developed it. So we are going to discuss briefly rhinitis. Rhinitis is also called coriza, and is an irritation, of, irritation and inflammation of the mucous membrane inside the nose. I think I've explained that. What causes that irritation is either the virus or the bacteria. So as soon as rhinitis setting or coriza setting, it is always characterized by inflammation and irritation of mucous membrane or the nose. And when it is not caused by virus or bacteria, other allergen can equally cause a, uh, rhinitis. And that depends on the environment you find yourself. If you are allergic to allergic uh, or pollen, pollen grains around you, don't move closer to them because they may be a serious predisposing factors to 
rhinitis. So this condition can have significant impact on quality of life and contribute to sinus, air, air and sleep problems and learning disorders. So when we say rhinitis, you know I said, don't let us take it from the face of being might or just a temporary to even go to work. And that can necessitate or lead to some other conditions as well. The rhinitis often persists with other respiratory disorders. We can see that in asthmatic patients and COVID-19 uh, patients as we currently have it now. Let me quickly chronicle the types of rhinitis. One, we have infectious rhinitis, non-allergic or fasomotor rhinitis, allergic rhinitis, and rhinitis that may occur as a result of the season that we have. We call it seasonal rhinitis. You, you agree with me that during Amatan season, many of us come down with uh, rhinitis. So when you see people coming down with that type of rhinitis, it is called seasonal or perennial rhinitis. I hope you are following. Briefly, the pathophysiology. I won't take much time on this. Just get to understand that the moment there is infection of this mic microbacteria, they target the, the goblet cell in the mucous membrane, inflame it, and with it, there is going to be a serious uh, proliferation of the goblet cells, leading to more secretions. And an individual may have present with nasal decongestion, headaches, uh, fever, and, and the likes. Even restlessness, sleep, sleeplessness can also come with it, irrespective of what causes that rhinitis. Inflammation is key to the I hope you have gotten that so you can go and read more on rhinitis and other conditions that are of upper respiratory tract uh, in nature. The clinical manifestations, this will include as it has happened to some of us at one time or the other before, purulent discharges containing bacteria or viruses, uh, runny nose, nasal congestion, sneezing, parietals of the nose, roof of the parietals of the nose, parietals of the roof of the mouth, throat, and eyes, and even our ears. Because the infection, any infection that affects the nose can equally migrate to, to the either the high or the, the air. So headache is another significant symptoms. And most importantly, for patients that have rhinosinusitis, they can come down with serious and or severe Headache. No allergic rhinitis can occur throughout the year. So note that we have seen some, some people that their nose doesn't get dry throughout the year. Those one may be suffering from non-allergic rhinitis. Then the management. The management depends on the cause, which may be identified through the history and physical examination. So as nurses, the owners lie on you to ask for the sign and symptoms the patient is presenting. Not the same drug that is used for Mr. A that should be used for Mr. B. Some may not even need drugs. All they need to do is just to excuse themselves from the environment where they are exposed to the allergen. Then if it is a, it's of viral origin, medication can be prescribed of a, a antivirus, antiviral forms. And another thing that you can do as nurses, is for you to give drugs prescribed all as an antihistamine and corticosteroid drug. In some developed world, they are, I've read that there are some e, uh, immunotherapy that are given to patients with serious or severe uh, rhinitis. But I decided not to put it here because we are not familiar with that in this part of the world. So if symptoms suggest a bacterial infection, antimicrobial drugs can be given to this patient. So as nurses, our teaching is very, very key.
to patient getting out of these conditions. For example, a patient that allergen or some irritant that brings him to this level of uh, rhinitis, all we need to do is just to uh, educate the individual to excuse himself from whatever that is causing or aggravating this uh, condition. Then our uh, patient's education must be very key here. Yeah. For example, a patient that is not smoking, but is, uh, uh, is, is, is very close or is living with a smoker. So even when you cannot do, totally do away with that individual, all you need to do, one, you can cover your nose, two, you can excuse yourself from that environment, and you can equally advise the individual to stop that smoking, although it's not come, uh, the control may not come so sudden, but your advice will be very key in this regard. I hope we are together. All right, uh, we go to atelectasis, and that may be my final bus stop for this lecture today. Atelectasis, when the word atlas means collapse, collapse, and when we attach it to the lungs, then and that's where we make we make we make it atelectasis. Uh, so when we say atelectasis, we are saying is a condition that affects the level of oxygen we are bringing breathing in and out or the level of or the capacity of our lungs to be able to expand and contract so anything that affects that ability to for of realization and contractility of the lungs that will lead to collapse or blockage of the uh, airflow to to the alveoli and that could be termed atelectasis after the trap of alveolar air is absorbed into the bloodstream, no additional air can enter into the alveolar because of the blocking. Let me quickly explain this. The, alveol the alveolar as they are, they are, they are very tiny. And anything that can, any uh, virus or bacteria that can enter this place, block it, will prevent the further flow of air. And what happens to that individual subsequently is accumulation of uh, carbon dioxide. And when that happen, then uh, toxicity of the air coming to the lungs or staying in the lungs may occur. Possible causes of this condition may be uh, retain of uh, secretion, chest pain, alteration in small air function, prolonged supine position of a patient, you place a patient on continuous prolonged uh, supine position, the inverse can be exposed to atelectasis. Increased abdominal pressure, reduced lung volumes due to musculoskeletal or neurological disorders can also predispose patients to collapse of the lung. Restrictive defects and specific surgical procedures. During surgical procedures, a patient has been subjected to anesthetics. This individual can, if not reverse on time or not done by an expert, the individual can come down with collapse of, of the lungs post-operatively. A monotonous or low tidal volume or no tidal breathing pattern may cause small airway closure and alveolar collapse. This is another cause for atletasis. I want you to read more on all of that that I've said. And finally for today, because I need to release you to go and read and prepare for the advanced medical surgical nursing questions next week. So I'm going to talk about the clinical manifestations of atelectasis. And one of it is, is that it is always insidious in nonsense. In another word, it's always gradual. Many a times you may not notice it. All the patients or the nurses will be doing. It also be checking the uh, oxygen saturation, giving up, giving uh, oxygen to this patient. And if care is not taken to actually monitor the tidal volume of this patient adequately, the individual may be may actually be losing the lungs uh, without the healthcare practitioner actually knowing. Another sign of snow may be this now. At this point, it becomes so obvious. Because you can see the patient being the snake, you couldn't breathe well again. The patient may start coughing 
and production of uh, excessive sputum is another critical sign that you watch out for and you know that this patient is actually going into a serious lung collapse. So other signs and symptoms may be cerebral, central nervous system uh, cyanosis. The individual may have something like a hypo hyposemia. So tachycardia, tachypnea, pleural, pleural, um, and the light and the lights may occur in this condition. It is on this note that I'm going to end our conversation for today because we cannot discuss everything. So I'm going to leave you to go and read all you have been taught in NSC 404. And I'll be hoping that many of you will come out the best by next week that will be having the exam. Meanwhile, let me quickly give you these hints. Initially, at the beginning of this class, I said nobody at this point should be developing any phobia again for this exam. Because the question that will be coming out, they are going to be coming out from the course material you have been given and what you have learned during your online lectures. So if that is the case, then nobody should be scared. Number two, I want you to quick to note that to answer the questions that of the exam that will be coming up next week, it will not require any, any extra stress than you reading. All you need to, to do is to read in between lines. Eh? Because the question, let me please give you, it's going to involve objectives, it's going to involve filling the gaps, it's going to involve theories. So, because many of you have been asking what is going to be the type of the question. That is the type of the question. So go and read everything. Be studious and prepare well, and I pray that God will crown your efforts. So in a few minutes, I will be welcoming contributions, questions, observation, and what have you. You can raise your hand if you have any question or concern. If you're having any question, question on that part, raise your hand. Your hand. Once, once we are on mute, then, then which means you can ask your question. question. Thank, Thank you. you. Safa, for last time, Kemi, your question. question. <laughs> It means majority of you just raise your hands. You don't have any question. Maybe you are doing this. Oh, I've gotten what? what I want to ask from you. I've gotten it, sir. I've gotten it okay, right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, after this class, if you don't have any question and you are still ruminating on it, you have any question, you are free to contact me via my WhatsApp or call and ask your question. Clarification and answers will be provided. Deborah, you can ask your question. Deborah. Deborah, Deborah ask your question. Deborah is still booty. Rasidat, that question. All right. In the absence of any questions, contribution, observation. <laughs> Hello. 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 Hello.